Okay. If y'all have a Bible, you can find a couple of places in the New Testament, and then we'll go back to the book of Genesis. That's an easy one to find. We'll find the book of Jonah again. subject in the Bible. I, you know, I'm going out on a limb to say that, but I still, I feel like it's probably, uh, if not the most misunderstood, it would certainly be in the top five misunderstood subjects in the Bible. So, uh, uh, and you probably wonder, what is that subject? That's the, that's the word salvation. And most time we associate that word salvation in a New Testament connotation because that's what we've been taught. And uh, I, I've mentioned this several times that the word salvation is actually used three or four times more in the Old Testament than it's used in the New Testament. And so you think that Jesus was the only person or the only one to offer salvation, but that salvation that Jesus offered us that we've been told is grossly misunderstood. It's not something that was new. It's something that has always been, and so it's hard to it's hard to get that. Well, when you when you uh, when we see when you see this word and how it's used, it will it'll shock you. I think it will, and not only shock you, hopefully surprise you in a great new way. And uh, so and and it's found it's found right here in the book of Jonah. And of course, Jesus said this. He said, this is the only sign I'm going to give you. Matthew chapter 14, he said, the sign of Jonah will be the only sign I give you. He said, y'all are looking for a sign, I'll give you a sign, the sign of Jonah. So mm -hmm. the only thing I can say is let's go to Jonah and see what he was saying. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Come on in, Miss Linda. I'm slow, but I'm coming. Yeah, you're slow, I'm sure. I'm you with me. Okay. <coughs> Things that have always been, but maybe not seen. Things that we have always heard, but maybe didn't hear. You understand? And we're good at that. We're real good at hearing things, but not hear what we're hearing. You know, selective hearing. You know what I'm saying? Jim, you gonna come up here on the front? Yeah. They play a room right here. You can have Miss Beverly seat since she's not feeling good today. Okay. 
Okay, I'll, I'll say this again, get everybody on the same page. The book of Jonah, find the book of Jonah, that's in the Old Testament, just go to the index, tell you what page to go to, and you just flip right over there. In my Bible, it's on page 900. So, <laughs> I don't think that you use it. King James date Bible. Book of John. Just look it up in your index and you can go right to it. Jesus said, when Jesus is talking to the crowds, Jesus made this statement, and, I, and I'll say this, that he said, there's not anything that I will say that I won't say it in parables. And parables just simply means a symbolic story that the story is not about real characters or real cities or real events. They're stories. And I use this analogy, and I, you know, I've, it's original with me. I've never heard it used before. How many of y'all have ever heard of Jack and the Beanstalk? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have y'all ever heard that story? Mm -hmm. Is it a story? Yes. A children's story? Yes. So Jack really didn't climb a beanstalk and talk to God? No. Really? really? That's yeah. terrible. That's sort of like telling me that Santa Claus ain't real. What? <laughs> uh -oh. So see, we have been told a lot of things that didn't understand that they were in story form. That's what a parable is. It's a story. It's a fabulous mm -hmm. story. All ancient cultures told fabulous stories. Or they call them this. The Greeks were phenomenal about it. When they were talking about Zeus, they weren't really talking about a man who grabbed hold of a bolt of lightning and flung it. <laughs> it wasn't a real guy. It was a mythological story. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the kicker. The story has tremendous content in the story and through the intention of telling the story. And that content is to stir something in your gut that's already there. Right. That's something we don't recognize. What have you got in your gut? What have you got deposited in you? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll tell you this. No matter who you are, where you come from, how old you are, you have a lot more in you than you realize. That's true. Way more than you yes. can imagine. And, I, and that's, what I want. that's what salvation is about, is to understand and realize and see what you already have. It's not something that you gain because you prayed a prayer and said, God, please forgive me, I've been a mess. It hadn't got anything to do with that. God understands our mess, His messes, <laughs> and loves us, period, no matter where we are in our journey in this beautiful dimension called the earth. So, saying that, I'm just going to quote you what Jesus said. Certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. And he answered and he said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but there are shall no sign be given you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Okay? Now you should know that's a story. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody, human being, going to live three days or three nights in the belly of a fish. They're not going to, I mean the, the muscles in the the, the juices, the acids that's in that, they're going to dissolve it, eat them up. Okay? The, I mean, you, we should know that. We should understand that. So it's a fabulous story. Let, so let's go back over to Jonah. If you got that, Jonah, I just wanted to read that to you and understand. That's the only sign he said I'm going to give you. So I'm going to give you this story in Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, 
And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. And I'm going to have to put my my stick man up here. Three days and three nights. And I, I put this on here and I do it because I am referring to your uh, endocrine glands. Everybody have them. You all have these seven major glands in your body. You have more, but you have these seven, and they are called endocrine glands. So, whenever, whenever your dad, could you do the top one a little darker? This one right here, mm -hmm. dark, make it darker. Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. All right. And so, I've, you know, that's my symbol. I call that the stick man. That's a picture of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is you. And this is more your inner working than your outer appearance, of how you see yourself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. This is, you have these glands inside your physical body which correlate to Eastern philosophy called the seven chakras, mm -hmm. which correlate to the story of of uh, Noah and the deluge or the flood which corresponds to the rainbow which corresponds to the Moses story and the seven golden candlestick so you go all the way through etc etc the Bible and you're going to find these stories about seven mm -hmm. so there's seven major facets to your physical body that builds you in the womb of your mother and these facets are called endocrine glands and so it, the endocrine glands, you got them, period. Mm -hmm. And they are the factors that started right when that seed, that semen of your dad, mm -hmm. left, injected that egg of your mom, mm -hmm. boom, and all of this begins to happen. These mm -hmm. seven endocrine glands begin to develop immediately. Mm -hmm. The first one that began to develop was up here in your brain, your pituitary gland and your pineal gland. Pituitary gland... And right back here in the center of your brain between the two left and right hemispheres, pineal gland right up here in the very front between the two left, left and right hemispheres of your brain. Mm -hmm. And the pineal gland is called the eye of God. That's mm -hmm. why you'll see people who are in Eastern religion, they'll draw that little dot right there. And all that means, they just that's a symbol simply saying they're trying to see with their dual vision what God sees with his single vision. Do you understand that? Okay. And so, so scriptures are about that very thing. Scriptures are about you and me seeing through the eye of God, yes. pineal gland, rather mm -hmm. than through the dualistic eyes mm -hmm. that sees and judges. Yeah. It always does that. It always mm -hmm. sees and judges. It's going to analyze it, try and figure this, 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 and that. When you get to be single-eyed, and that's what Jesus said. Remember John chapter 5, chapter, chapter 6 and 7, called the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. He said, when your eye is single, not dull, single. He didn't mean poke out your left one or the right one or just be like Cyclops and just have a big old eyeball right there. You already have that eye. You already have the eye of God. It's called the pineal gland. The pineal gland right here. That, be, that helps begin to build is right between your brain and that's the first thing that begins to build in the womb of your mother. It happens immediately. Mm -hmm. And within 22 days, those glands begin to build this structure in the womb of your mom and on the 22nd day, referring to the 22 Hebrew glyphs, on the 22 of them, on the 22nd day, this is a biological, anatomical, medical fact. On the 22nd day, your heart starts to beat. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because you have 22 energy points in your physical body which are represented by the ancient Hebrew alphabet. That's why this alphabet is so phenomenal. It's scientific. It's, it's, again, it's, used, it's anatomical, it's biological, it's about the structure. Gosh, if we, could, if we, we can get this. It's about the structure that God built, which He called His temple. He calls it His 
building, and it's your body. So you can touch yourself and you say, my body is God's building. You can touch yourself and say, my, God, my body is God's temple. This building is not God's temple. We built this building. I built this building with my hands and others helping me. God didn't build this building other than through my hands. Mm -hmm. Men build church buildings. Yes, but God builds its building, which is your body, yes. no matter where you're at in your journey in life. Mm -hmm. Your body is still God's temple. God still lives there and always, and ain't a thing you can do about it. Yeah. You can't get rid of it. Because He won't leave. Yeah. And when He does leave, then you just melt to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> or you pass out are you okay so notice that three days three is going to be the important number that we'll see here and we're going to try mm -hmm. to put some time on folks because three deals with salvation so in the story of Jesus how, how long was Jesus in the tomb three days three days three nights mm -hmm. and then what happened he's there three days and three nights one two three and then in the Early morning of into the fourth day, but he's already accomplished. He's already completed the three days and three nights. And now, then, on the fourth, on this this twenty second day, the heart begins to beat. He begins to come out of the tomb, mm -hmm. which is the same thing as you coming out of the womb. That's right. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Same word. <laughs> same word. Tomb, womb. Yeah. Same word. Just change mm -hmm. the T to a W or the W to a T. Okay, so chapter 2, three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Chapter 2, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cry by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Mm -hmm. So now it's not a fish's belly, now it's hell. So where is hell at? Mm -hmm. Hell's in the fish's belly. It would be like this. You could say hell is in, it is in the ground or in the womb or in the place where you're being built. You ever been to hell? <laughs> Every one of us live there most of the time. I do. Why? Because it's a place of working things out. That's, that's what it is. You can call it whatever. And people say, well, it's a fiery pit. No, it is definitely a fire, isn't it? Sometimes it, it's purging you and burning you and all those other wonderful things that it's doing to us and for us, in us and through us. And it is. So it's working. Okay, so you can do what you need to with that passage of Scripture. Look at verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer that came now I'm reading from the King James. He says, My soul fainted within me, and I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto me. Most of our prayers go out to hopefully somebody or something. Have you ever had your prayer come in? That's the one that works. Huh? <laughs> How do you get your prayer to go in as opposed to going out? Most of our prayers are pleading, are begging, are reasoning, are manipulating God to do what we want or what we need. Go out of our mouth. Or go, oh God, I need help. I need this. Da, 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 da. Out of your mouth. Doesn't it? Not, it? Right? It does, right? Yeah, it does. I know it does. Come on. Well, how do you get a prayer to go in? It's real simple. Now get this. You get somewhere in a quiet place and shut your mouth. And then close down everything that's running through your brain like something that's like a like a wild river running off a mountain. Yeah, all that mind stuff. All that's rushing through you. And then you get just totally quiet. In stillness. Quiet. That's when you begin to know God. That's when your prayer begins to count. That's when your prayer will work. It will go in to God's holy temple. Look and see what that says right there. See it right there in verse 7? 
when my soul fainted within me and I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto you, where was He at? Where was you at? Where was God at? In you. Mm -hmm. That's where God's at. God's in you. Right. And we're trying to get a hold of God outside of us constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard somebody say that they drive like me. Fast. <laughs> he said, you better slow down. God won't want to ride with you. I said, well, he rides with me. I need him to ride with me. No matter what speed we go. You know, he's comfortable at 100 mile an hour with me. Because we go there a lot. Came in unto thee, into the holy temple. Now, that's a powerful passage of Scripture. If you, mm -hmm. You'll just open yourself up and look into that and let it look into you, be into you. You didn't have to pray a prayer to get that. That's, the, that's one of the biggest facades we've ever... Well, if I could just get a hold of God, you know, get loud enough, get, get emotional enough, get serious enough, or get whatever. You just get quiet enough, mm -hmm. still enough, mm -hmm. and just get to know that that you've already got in you. Because that you got in you, you brought it into you the moment that your mama got tired of messing with you in her gut and said, it's time for you to come out. And she began to go into uh, birth pains and said, all right, we're going to deliver you out of the tomb, mm -hmm. the womb, and then you're going to come out of here. And God moved into you that very moment when you come out and took that first breath. <gasps> Ruach, that's the Hebrew word for spirit, that's the Hebrew word for breath. When you took that first breath, God come into you. And God coagulated with your entire body through your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Through this, this organ right here, your heart that began to pulse. Mm -hmm. Begin to push that air, God, breath, all through your whole body. That's a miracle. That's that phenomenal. That's you awesome. could just you could just settle down on that and just grab hold of that and mm -hmm. feed on that and realize it's it's in me. It's, it's God. It's Christ in you. That's what the Apostle Paul said. It's Christ mm -hmm. in you. It's God in you. Yeah. That's your hope of glory. Mm -hmm. That's your hope of everything that you long for. Long for. Verse eight. The, they that observe lying vanities. Forsake their own mercy. Whew. That's good, isn't it? What do you mean, lying vanity? That's false. It's running through your head. It's not the truth. Like you know, I'm I'm gonna fail. I'm 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 gonna die. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna you know you know how they are. I mean, they just keep running along. You know, you're worried about this. You're concerned about that. You're stressed over this that. You know how it is. Those are lying vanities. They're not the truth. They're not the truth. They're they're just they're just winds that blow. Mm -hmm. Verse nine, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. It, that's what Paul says. And everything give thanks. And does everything mean everything? Does everything mm -hmm. mean when I'm sick? Does everything mean when I don't feel good? Does every mm -hmm. everything in everything? Does it mean everything? It mm -hmm. means exactly that. Everything give thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. I think you're working something out in me and working out something through me. Mm -hmm. I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that. I have vowed salvation is of God. That word salvation in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word yesh uah. Yesh uah. Salvation. That's the Hebrew word yesh Ooh, and that word, now get this, it doesn't mean what you and I have been told that word, the word salvation means. Listen to this. Yeshua, that word means to be whole. Mm -hmm. And why does it mean that? Because you see, you started out a divided being. You started out a physical body and a spiritual body. And they weren't, they weren't in harmony. They weren't, they weren't uh, flowing together. They need to flow together. Because if they're not flowing together, and many times you can live your whole life and they don't flow. Mm -hmm. You can live you can live and die and they mm -hmm. never flow. So you come back again and then you'll get another opportunity to see if they can flow together. Mm -hmm. Because it's that's called wholeness, W-H-O-L-E, mm -hmm. which we get our word holy, H-O-L-Y from. 
holy, H-O-L-Y, is the same thing as W-H-O-L-L-Y. They're the same thing. So if you're holy, you're holy. <laughs> that means you're, you're united, you're one. That's what the word salvation means. A divided house is in turmoil. You're constantly struggling. You constantly struggle. Where do you do that? Where's your struggle at? Not necessarily physically, more mentally. Right. More than it's mental. Mm -hmm. it, it's that the thoughts that you have to deal with. The yeah. Thoughts that you think and maybe never express words with them, but you still think those things. Mm -hmm. So that's the first meaning of the word. Yeshua. It means wholeness. It means deliverance. It means health. Would like some of that, right? It means prosperity. It sounds just exactly like the name Yeshua mm -hmm. or Joshua. That's how we would say it. Basically spelled almost the same and numerically in value exactly the same. So whether we're talking about salvation, which is Yeshua, or we're talking about Joshua, which is Yehoshua, we're talking about exactly the same thing. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, the sixth book is the book of Joshua. The whole book is about Joshua or deliverance or wholeness or salvation. Same thing. It's all about it. That's, the, that's what God's message to all of us is. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God created us, put us in an environment, this environment, and I'll say this, this environment can be very hostile but it can also be a paradise. And you get to choose which one is it going to be. You get to make that choice. Am I going to make a paradise out of my hell? Am I going to take this hostile situation and turn it into a situation of wholeness or health or well-being? It's totally up to us. And God gives us the ability to do whatever we want to do. Either way. Either way we want to do it. So go with me to the book of John. We're going to work on that word of salvation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 14. verse here and you probably you can quote this verse or many of you could but you'll remember it I'm sure when we read it John chapter 14 I'm pretty sure you're going to remember it or remember hearing it if you haven't read it John chapter 14 and look at verse 26 right guy John 14 verse 26 says but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost. I'm reading from the King James. Mm -hmm. I will always say this. The word holy is not there in the Greek. I, I, I hate to break that to you. And the word ghost is not there in the Greek. Period. Actually the word here in the Greek is pneuma. Which is the same thing as the Hebrew ruach. It simply means breath. Same word. You know, I don't know if you have, any of y'all have a translation that says that. Does anybody have a translation? I think the King James uses the word ghost. Does yours? Spirit. Mine says Use ghost. spirit. Mine says, ghost. Mine says spirit. spirit. Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. I think the King James is one of the only ones that used the word ghost. And the reason they did that, that's an old English word they added calling a spirit ghost. And that's where the idea of ghost come from. And dear Lord, we've got, we terrify children with that, uh, that idea about ghosts. You know, the monsters. It actually is the, it's the Hebrew word pneuma. It means spirit. And, and of course, uh, okay. But anyway, we'll look at it. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, whom the Father will send unto you in my name, he will teach you all things. Notice that. Who's going to teach you? The Father. The Spirit. What's the Spirit going to teach you? Everything. And bring everything, teach you all things, and bring all things 
to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, same thing, the Spirit is going to bring all things to your remembrance. Mm -hmm. Or you might say it this way, where do you where do you put your memories? In your mind, don't you? That's where they're at, right? They're in your mind. Where, where's your mind at? You know, and most of us, is, I, I would even do that and say, that's, that's my mind. No, it's my brain. My brain is an organ that's in my body that reacts to my mind. Because my mind is energy that sends a signal. And many times my mind is in my heart. Right? So, so many times you remember it where? In your heart. You stump your toe, then your mind's in your toe. Right? Yeah. You say, oh, that hurt. Where did it hurt? Did it hurt up here in your head when you stumped your toe? No, it hurt your foot. So see, your mind is an auric field that's all about you. It's all around you. You know, the auric field and your mind basically are the same thing. But your mind is where you store all these memories. And notice what he said. He said, The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. Mm -hmm. Alright, go with me to the book of Hebrews. I know this is... A uh, little Bible drill, so to speak. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8. And I'm really basically driving at a point, which I hope you'll grab it in just a minute. And I think you will. I know you will. And you'll, I hope you see it right here when I get to this. Hebrews, chapter 8. Verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws, that word laws, I will put my laws, that word laws is nomos. And actually, actually it just means regulations. Our regulations, our orders, are the order of things. That's it, he's not talking about thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. He's not talking about that's not what God is saying. God's not saying don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. God is saying do this. You get stuck on the don't do's instead of doing the do's. Do what God tells you to do. Do, do what God shows you in its order. In the order of things. If you're not doing it in the order of the things, then you're doing it out of order. What does that cause? What does things out of order? What? Chaos. What? Exactly. Chaos. Well, how come we have so much chaos in our life? It's not complicated. It's called out of order. <laughs> <laughs> they put it on the public door a lot. Mm -hmm. It's out of order. What does that mean? It's not functioning. That's what that word, I will put my order. Look, look at this passage of Scripture. I will put my order where? In their mind. In their mind and write it in their heart. Where? In your mind and write it in your heart. Where is that? In your mind. Because your mind is God's mind if you get fine-tuned to it. And it's in your heart. Heart being the whole core of your being. Not just that not just that cardia that's pumping on 22 days, but the whole core of your being. You know, if you look at the heart of a pine tree, and the pine tree at the bottom, you know, is, is two foot thick, and you cut the tree down and you get the heart, you can go to the very top of that pine tree that's just no bigger than an inch around, and guess what? The heart's still there. So the heart is from the root of that tree all the way through the stem of that tree just exactly like mm -hmm. your heart your heart goes and it's connected all the way through mm -hmm. that, that's your heart that's what it's referring to when it's talking about the heart it's not just talking about 
that organ that's pumping blood. It's talking about the very core of your being. So where did God say, I'm going to put my order at? So according to Jonah, if you, how are you going to get a hold of God? How are you going to pray? You're going to go within yourself. You've got to get quiet. You have to go within yourself. It's there. I don't care who you are. It ain't there because you memorized the Bible. It's not there because you read all the Bible. That ain't got nothing to do with it. Or you read the, the, the Koran, or you've read the Tao Te Ching. It, it's not there because you read a holy book. It's there because you are a holy book. And we have got to come to the place that we learn how to read our own holy book. Which is the book of your heart. What is the book of your heart telling you? Many times you might be, if you're not listening clearly, you might think, wow, I'm not sure if I want to do that. Well, if God's telling you and it's the book of your heart, it will work out okay. It will be fine. That's because that's what God plans. That's what God has in store for us. That's where my salvation is at. It's more in my heart and more uh, me getting to that place because he says, I will write my order. I, I can't say that enough. Order. And, and again, I, I looked this up so that I could tell you the meaning of that word. It just simply means uh, the executive order. Mm -hmm. The executive authority. You know, where is that at? It's, it's within your very being. God said, I'll write it on the table of your heart and write it in your mind. Okay. Won't you go with me to Genesis chapter 1 now? <coughs> Without a doubt, the most misunderstood book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. Especially the first three chapters. And I, you know, I would say that as I work on trying to labor to get a book in print about these things, what I would work at more than anything would be setting in order first things first, in other words, getting the principles of what this book we call the Bible is about. It's not a history book about a people that God chose because He loves them more than anybody else on the earth. It, it, it's really not that. The Bible is a book about God's building, God's house, which is your body. And if you realize that, if you ever come to that awareness or that understanding that you see, wow, the Bible and the stories in the Bible are really a book about my body, about the things that I, that I run into in life, then I hope that it might strike a fire in you and you might go to reading it again. <laughs> Most people don't ever read it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I always say, I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't read it either if you're going to get out of it what you've been getting out of it for nearly 1,700 years. Mm -hmm. What's the sense in it? Because you get, people get confused because of the way they've translated it. Mm -hmm. They've taken out, they've added to, they, they've manipulated it. So if you go in it, you've got to really get into it to see what is it saying. It's talking to you. It's a book about you. It's not a book about that. It's a book about you. And when you approach it that way, and, and you know, it's not something that's brand new. It's not something that I'm just trying to convince people of. You are God's building. You are God's house. So why would God not write a book to show you how His building and how His house is in order? That makes sense to me. Yeah. So God's going to write a book and show you how that this. But you got to get in there and see what it's saying. Mm -hmm. And if you get off the, if you start in the Genesis chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. If you start there and you make that literal historical and try to say that's something happened six thousand or seven thousand years ago, you're off track right to start with. Mm -hmm. So your train ain't going to go right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just get to not you know, get the train a little off track. Mm -hmm. It ain't gonna go right. right. So when you start with that idea, it's not that. That that this book is not that. This book is a mystery book. Mystery. Mystery. You understand what a mystery is? Mystery is a secret. You understand where the secret's at? The secret's in you. What is the secret? It's God in you. God in you. Not out there somewhere. So when you really get to that place and you say, oh, I really do need God. I need, well, just go within yourself. Because God is right there. 
God is the life that lives you and the life that lives through you. So we start out in the book of Genesis with this, this idea of Genesis, Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. We start out with this idea and it's called seven days. And really what it is is the Hebrew book, Hebrew word yom, Y-O-W-M and what that word means is life or facets. How do you spell it? F-A-S-C-E-T-S? Is that close enough? Facets of life. That's what that word yom in Hebrew is about. It's not about seven 24 hour day and you and if God really worked hard for six of these 24 hour days worked real hard and after six days of hard work he said man I'm tired I'm going to rest tomorrow because, and the Bible says this God neither slumbers nor sleeps he doesn't rest he's busy all the time he didn't get tired and said oh man that's a lot of work Right? He didn't do that. No. God, God neither slumbers nor sleeps. Mm -hmm. So the word day, actually it's the Hebrew word yom, it means life. It means facets of life. It means healthy life. It means happy life. It means long life. Mm -hmm. It's used that way in the Old Testament. Psalms 91, 16. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. I'm just quoting that. That's Psalms 91, verse 16. With long life. It's that same word right there. Long life. Yom. Mm -hmm. Now why didn't they take that passage over in Psalms 91, 16, like I'm just quoting you. Why didn't they put day there? Mm -hmm. That wouldn't make sense, would it? God said, well, with a day, I'm going to satisfy mm -hmm. Just a day? <laughs> just one day? I mean, is that it? Was it going to be Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? Which one of them days? <laughs> You wouldn't buy that, would you? Mm -hmm. But why you buying it? Why you're buying it in Genesis one? Mm -hmm. Because you see, that's what you've been taught. So on the very first day, it, it's the actually it's the word e c h a d ekad in Hebrew, ekad, and actually the word means to unite. God. So the very first principle that God puts in place, Genesis 1 verse 5, is Ikad, unite, mm -hmm. bring together. And God translated for the word first. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean first. The word first in Hebrew is Rashit, R-A-S-H-E-Y-T. Rashit, that means first. And it has more to do with birthing. The word Rashi in Hebrew has to do with bringing a child into, the, into this earth. That's why in Genesis chapter 25, the story of Rebekah's children are two. Esau and Jacob. One of them represents the spirit. One of them represents the matter. And what is the work in life that you have? It's to bring those two together in unity. First thing. First thing. And you, you spend your whole life doing that. Mm -hmm. Bring those two together right. in unity. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second day, the second facet of Yom, uh, which, which is we have right here, it's uh, It's in verse 8. It said, God called the firm of heaven and create in the evening and the morning were the second day. And so when he did the second day, uh, it said, what is that Hebrew word? Shanae. And actually the word Shanae Shanae means to uh, it means to fall back to fall back 
Y'all you know what that is up there? That little squiggly thing there? Huh? DNA. Exactly. That's a DNA. That's a double stranded. Everybody say double. Double, double stranded. Double <laughs> second day. So the first thing that happens when that seed left your father went into that egg, that was two separate things, right? Mm -hmm. The seed's one thing, it's a sail. The egg's one thing, it's a sail. And what happens when that seed went in there, those two become one. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You have an RNA strand from your daddy, and you have an RNA strand from your mama, and guess, look here now, now you have DNA, and what does that DNA do? It is the blueprint that builds the physical body. It starts out with, with just two cells, and within just moments, it's hundreds of thousands of cells. Why? It just duplicates, 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 duplicates. It just continually does that, and then all of a sudden, it begins to, because in the DNA is the architectural print of your physical body. It starts to build your body. So Genesis chapter 1 is building God's temple. Why? You think God built a house and stood back and looked at, man, that's a pretty house. Just going to let it stand there for thousands of years? Won't you use it? Oh, you mean reckon I to move into my house? Well, that's a pretty good idea. What do y'all think about that? <laughs> you think God built it and ain't going to use it? God built it and ain't going to move into it? No. God built it and then you get to the third day. This is the this is the this is the beautiful part. Now listen to this. God didn't build it knowing that he's putting it in a hostile environment and it's gonna put there and it's just gonna, you know, maybe it'll make it, maybe it won't. He built it, put it in this environment, but then he put itself in it so that in this environment it's filled with power, filled with energy, filled with ability. And we are, and many times we use that power, we use that energy against ourselves because we don't understand the order of it. And so we just do it in ignorance. You know, and God looks at it, I'm sure like we look at little Joe and say, oh, they'll be all right. They'll get through it. <laughs> Walk it off. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to come down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Because this is... This is the beauty. When we get down to this part right here, it just, this is where it begins to get. I, I pray that you see some of what I'm trying to say when I talk about the first day, the second day, when I'm talking about Ekad, I'm talking about Shanae, I'm talking about the DNA structure, mm -hmm. the architectural work. You, you can see how that begins to unfold and how, don't you? You can see the biological working of that. Yes. The anatomical building of the physical body. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a mystery even today in medical science. Mm -hmm. But they're studying it and they're getting, they're getting more out of what the original ancient Hebrew said than they even realize and they're not even trying to find it that way. Mm -hmm. So, look at verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding yielding what? Seed. Seed. That's the key. Yielding seed. Jesus said in John chapter 14, He said, until a seed falls into the ground. Everybody say the ground. The ground. Let's just say it this way. The environment that's prepared for that seed. Mm -hmm. See, there is an environment prepared for every seed. It's like now I'm thinking about I want to start planting a winter garden. Why? Because the environment is designed for that particular seed. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's just like if you're going to plant corn, squash, okra, mm -hmm. their environment is part of the order for that seed. In other words, I didn't go out there and plant my corn and my squash in January, February when the temperature is down and freezing. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I do that? Get ahead of the thing. I'd get way ahead of the thing. Why wouldn't I do that? Because the environment's not prepared. 
In other words, the order is not ready. You have to do it in the order of things. So now what would I do because we're moving into fall, there are fall or winter crops that you can grow. So now then the environment is, the order is being prepared for that seed. Just exactly like your mother, your mother had to have a certain environment, so she only come, at, I think, what is that, 24 or 48 hours? Some of you ladies, do you know exactly how long that she, what does she ovulate? She's at that, that she can only get pregnant during that period of time. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people, Amish people, or uh, some people, I think even some of the Catholics, they learn to tell, if the husband learns to tell by the temperature of the, of the wife's body, when she can get pregnant. Because there's only that certain period of time when she can get pregnant. She can't just get pregnant any time during the month. Mm -hmm. She only it's only a certain certain time mm -hmm. during that month. If that happens, why? Because that's the order of the thing. Mm -hmm. So watch this. This 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 is a powerful, powerful pack. And it's been passed over by by scholars for Hundreds and hundreds, even a thousand, seventeen hundred years. I want to read you something that this author said about this particular passage of Scripture. He says, in spite of the lame translation, the two shins and the two yods appear here. One life is mentioned as universally bestowed and the other is endogenous. Having to do with the endocrine glands. Wow. If you can hear Wow. What did he just say? He just said what he just said in spite of the lame translation. In other words, in spite of what they have done to dumb us down by not translating this accurate from the original Hebrew. Mm -hmm. In spite of it, it's still here hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And it's in that word right there. It's in the seed. Do you know, or I, I know you know, but we don't pay any attention. Do you know that your words are seeds? Mm -hmm. When Jesus is talking about in Mark 4, He talks about the farmer sowing. Mm -hmm. And, they, and they, everybody got confused. Said, what are you talking about? And they come to Him, His disciples come to Him in that Mark chapter 4, verse 12, 13, 14. They said, what do you, what's the parable? What do you mean by this saying that the farmer goes out and plants his seed and some of them grow and some of them don't? What do you do with that? And so Jesus comes back and he says, okay, those that want to know, those that are asking the questions, he begins to give the answer. You say, well, why didn't he stand up there and explain that to everybody, those 4,000 people, five or 6,000 people? Why didn't he explain that to all of them? Y'all ever asked that question? Because it tells you very clearly he didn't. Y'all looking at me like a cow that's in Newgate. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Hold your finger right here real quickly and just go to Mark chapter 4. Just real quick. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 4. Come back over there to Genesis chapter 1 real quick. I'll try to wrap this up right here. Because it's right here in the seed. It's in the seed. Everything's in the seed. Everything has a seed. Mm -hmm. Everything has a seed. I don't care what it is. Even though you think it don't have a seed. We constantly spew seeds out of our mouth. I'm spewing mm -hmm. seeds right now. Yeah. I'm praying that my seeds are falling on good ground. Ground that can hear, ground that's ready to prepare, ground that's ordered, that can grow. Mm -hmm. Because words are seeds. When you say words, you can say words to, to hurt, you can say words to kill or destroy. Sorry. They're seeds. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark chapter 4, do you see that? Verse 2 says, and he taught, he taught them many things by parables. In other words, fabulous stories. Not literal events, but fabulous stories. That's what a parable is. Many things by parable. He said unto them in his teaching. King James says doctrine. It actually is not a doctrine. It is a teaching. He said, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. 
And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground where it had not, we had not much earth. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns. Now, you know, what he's saying right here is, it's like uh, you're hearing seed song, words, and then all of a sudden your mind goes on the things that you've got to do next week. Even though that word, that seed's being sown in you, mm -hmm. ain't going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the sun's going to shine on it because it didn't have any root. There was no attention paid to it. You don't know what he said. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, I did. Did what he say? I don't know. <laughs> you remember I told you that story about when I went to the mountains up there and they're preaching that pre that preacher. <laughs> and I thought he was going to die up there. Mm -hmm. And his and Connie's aunt came to me and said, Boy, wasn't that good preaching? I said, I don't know. What did he say? She said, I don't know, but it sure was good. <laughs> <laughs> Stony ground. Stony ground. I don't know, but buddy, it was good. What happened? She got her feelings tickled. Did she get anything? No. That's what Jesus is saying right here. This is a parable. This is a fabulous story. Verse 8. And others fell on good ground, did yield fruit, and sprang up, and increased, and brought forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Huh? You reckon some of them had their ears cut off? Huh? Maybe they had muffins over their ears. That's their side, ain't it? You've got 4,000 people sitting out here with muffins over their ears. What's the sense in that? Mm -hmm. you got 4,000 people with their ears cut off. Did they all have ears? Yes. Of course they had ears. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't they hear? Seeds being sown. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't they hear? Verse 10. And when he was alone, in other words, he, he went ahead and said all that, and they were waking up scratching their head. What did he say? And when he was alone... They that were about him with the twelve ask of him the parable. Huh. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. They, in other words, out of that four or five thousand people, the few that really wanted to hear, they were they were they were saying, Well, what's he saying? Mm -hmm. What does he mean? Mm -hmm. So they, with the twelve, his disciples, these were ones, these were initiates, they have been initiated into the things he's teaching so they were with him to learn more they that were with him look what it said they said, they said when he was alone they were with him with the twelve ask of him the parable and he said unto them it don't do any good to just spew it out into the field of somebody that's not even asking I remember it, that could become a revelation to me with my kids and my grandkids mm -hmm. They're not gonna. They're not gonna hear until they ask. Mm -hmm. When they ask the question, then they're ready to hear mm -hmm. the answer. They're not ready. You know, like in a lot of Eastern traditions or a lot, a lot of different philosophies, they don't even start teaching until the kids are 12 year old. Mm -hmm. Until they get to the place where they're ready to ask the question about what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. So they ask that question. And so he told him, all right, go back with me, Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry about that side track there. The seed. The seed is so important. And the order, the order that God has put in place for the seed is important. Mm -hmm. right? right? Absolutely. So look at look at chapter chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. We're, we're going to close right here. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb, yielding seed, yielding seed, fruit trees, yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is where? In himself. Everything that God created had a seed in itself. Everything. That means you. That means that, that means not only you but actually the deposit of God itself in you mm -hmm. had its seed. Yes. Watch this, verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass 
herb yielding seed after its kind, the tree mm -hmm. yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Pay attention to that. Whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw it was good and God and the evening and the morning were the third day. The third day. That third day. Uh, let me put the third day on here. That's Sheen Lamid Yod Sheen Lamid. And that's the third day. And this this word is called Shili Sheen. Everybody can say it. You can say it. Sheen Lamid Yod Shili. Shili. Sheen Yod Sheen. Shili Sheen. That's, 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 a, that's a beautiful word. Shili Sheen. What does that mean? That, well, look at this word. It's got two sheens in it. it you know, when the word's like that, and they, they got two, two glyphs of the same, two sheens, which a sheen means the breath. That's 300, it's the breath. And it's got two yodes in it. And the yod is the 10, and that's the male-female, or that's the ability to reproduce itself. That's, you, know, you have to have a male and a female. The male has to carry a seed, the female has to carry an egg. Nothing's produced without that. Everything has to have that. Mm -hmm. This word right here is referring to after the third day. Mm -hmm. This is what God did. He put the shilly sheen. It means the seed is in it to produce itself. Mm -hmm. The seed of God is in you to produce God through you. The seed, the seed of your physical body is in you to produce in the physical through you. That's what the third day is. That's why that you see all these third day stories. They're all through scriptures. It's not just Jesus being died and crucified and raised in the third day. Same thing happened to Jonah. Same thing happened to Joshua. It's just throughout the scriptures, if you start paying attention, you'll start seeing all this stuff happening on Shili Shin. <laughs> on, on, the, on the third day. After that, after that third day, then things. And if you watch the, your crop, that's what happens in your crop because on the third day, that uh, that hard shell is softened, and then the the ground, the magnetic energy that's in the earth, the magnetic energy in the earth pulls the root system down, while the energy, the electrical energy from the sun, is pulling the shoot up. So you got a root coming down, you got a shoot going up. Mm -hmm. And you said, Oh, I'm being pulled apart. Mm -hmm. Ever been there? Yep. That's a good place. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, well we'll just quit there. We'll see the sheep. Okay. You know another word that I could call this, and I looked this word up. I could call this endocrinology. That's another word that I would, I didn't invent that word. Wished I had, but I didn't. It's a, it is a word. And of course you can hear it. it. It just actually means the concern of structure or function or disorder of the endocrine glands. I got that out of Gray's Anatomy on the physical body. Because these endocrine glands, the seven endocrine glands is what the whole Bible is about. It's God's temple, it's God's building. So really it's about endo endocrinology. I thought that I thought that's a really good word. It's not used. It's not used at all. I don't hardly I hardly see or hear of anybody using that word. Endocrinology. Okay. Any questions? Huh? Too much? <laughs> a bunch, ain't it, Jim? That's a bunch, ain't it? You know, it's like saying you read, you want to rewrite the scripture. No, I would like to just reread the scripture the way it was intended to be read. And sad to say, that's not easy. It's hard. It really is hard. Mm -hmm. You might be sitting there wondering, do I have to learn Hebrew? Yeah, probably. Do you have to study and research? Yeah, probably. 
you know, or you can take the basic things that resonate with you and just marinate on them, mm -hmm. and they will, they'll be a life force for you. Mm -hmm. You hear what I mean when I say that? They'll be life, it will be life. You know, just like chewing a good steak, it's, it's life for you. Just to, just to ruminate on it, muse on it, ponder on it, think on it, and then see if that won't give you life. I know it will.